up, or at least bring him downtown. Go big, Judge Moxilla Apadii. Get Trump's legal team's response to the government demand for evidentiary protection after this weekend orgy of Trump attacks. Say that response is insufficient. Announce you need an in-person hearing with Trump. Rule the defendant clearly did not understand the terms of his release. And drag him back into court tomorrow, saying you need to state these terms to him again. Warn him explicitly. Any more of this, one more social media post, one more reference in a speech, and you, sir, will find that your liberty is at an end. Do it. Do it now, because this is not somehow just going to end here. Since the judge released him and warned him, he has attacked the judge. He has attacked the prosecutor. He has attacked at least one of the witnesses. He has attacked the venue. He has attacked the government. He has attacked the U.S. World Cup soccer team. This took only the three days after the judge warned him not to do any of that, except the soccer part. When Trump's latest, I was only relying on the bad advice of bad counsel, counsel submits his response to the government's demand for an order protecting the evidence from Trump's compulsion to violate all laws and intimidate all authority. When she gets that response, which was due by 5 p.m. Eastern Monday, Judge Apadii should not only grant the motion, she needs to jump right to the inevitable end of this process. Donald Trump is a menace to everyone involved in this, his newest indictment. He is a clear and present danger to everyone in the United States, and based on the wounded, dying animal look that was so unmistakable in his eyes during his speech at Montgomery Saturday night, he might even be a danger to himself and those around him. He is testing the judge to see how much he can get away with, and the answer to that should be nothing. Lock him up. Revoke his pretrial release or come within an inch of it. Trump has never been stopped in his tracks before and is not automatically capable of understanding the concept of a warning. To him, a warning is weakness, vulnerability, an invitation to push harder in the same spot or find a new spot to push. This is a psychopath who doxed his predecessor as president. In the full bloom of his madness, he is now dancing along the precipice of issuing more and more calls for violence with less and less subtlety and more and more directness to them. The look in his eyes in Alabama implied that perhaps he already feels he has no reason not to test just the judge's limits right now, but to test America's. There is, in fact, a theory abroad, and though I have covered this madness virtually every day for eight years, I still find myself shocked to even contemplate saying this, that the attacks that began at 4.16 p.m. Friday with, if you go after me, I'm coming after you, are not just the continuation of his messianic insanity that began, frankly, in 1946, but a deliberate attempt to get his pre-trial release revoked, and get himself detained in some way so as to trigger his cult into actual violence. It's useful for Democrats to understand that if Trump spends a minute in jail on bullshit charges, writes the racist cartoonist Scott Adams, all the rules are suspended. We're a safer country with that clear understanding. That sentence might define the genuine menace of the fascist's dream of insurrection. Oh no, Dilbert is going to draw a civil war. And it may underscore that their years of fantasized bloodshed neglects the reality that maybe they are all armed, but they have forgotten who is in control of all the tanks and soldiers at the moment. There can be no doubt that Trump ultimately does expect his America to again rise up violently in his defense. At some point, it did before. The questions are if this is that point, and if it is, if he could really think so strategically as to trap a judge into lighting the fuse for him. That only increases the number of middlemen in this process. 
Just when you are inclined to think there might finally be such a method to his madness, he follows up a weekend of thinly veiled threats by blaming the U.S. loss in the World Cup on Joe Biden and writes, nice shot, Megan. And unless Megan Rapino is a witness against him, you are forced to remember Occam's razor and how it applies even to Donald Trump. Sure, this is what you might do if you wanted to deftly position others to cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war, but this is also what you would do if you were 100% bat guano insane like Donald Trump. Because whatever the explanation, and whether or not Scott Adams has an arsenal ready of 50,000 sketch pencils sharpened to spear-like points, in all colors. Trump has still made those threats and they must be dealt with severely and immediately. In the I'm coming after you post, he threatened everybody from his critics to Joe Biden. In the Alabama speech, he told Republicans they could not allow this to go on and they had to, quote, fight fire with fire. In South Carolina and on social media, he called special counsel Smith deranged and a sick man again. On Sunday morning, he repeated the Smith attack on social media and misspelled Joe Biden's name in the process. Ten minutes later, he not only attacked Judge Chutkin by posting that she was incapable of presiding over a fair trial, but also alleged that she will knowingly preside over that trial, even though she knows she cannot be fair. And just to top it off, he declared Washington a filthy and crime-ridden embarrassment to our nation, even though crime has dropped because he left town. And in the same sentence, he declared that he should get a change of venue because he has declared it a filthy and crime-ridden embarrassment with the implication that everybody there is now mad at him. Were this defendant anybody else in this country, he would have been in jail before Saturday morning. A Twitch streamer named Kai Sinat promised his followers video consoles on Friday. They swarmed New York's Union Square, several thousand. They damaged some property. They threw some things. But practically speaking, the worst thing that happened was that a lot of subway trains skipped the stop and the Friday commute home was disturbed. Sonat, a 21-year-old moron, was immediately charged with first-degree felony rioting inciting a riot and unlawful assembly, and he now faces 10 years in prison. He is actually in more trouble right now than he is Donald Trump. And the comparison of their crimes is not arbitrary. Trump committed more offenses than Kai Sinat did this weekend just in New York City, as was the case when Judge Apadiai let him walk out of the Prettyman courthouse last Thursday, when Judge Juan Mershon let Trump walk out of the New York City courthouse in April with the understanding that he must not commit any new crimes. Yet he spent the weekend criminally threatening everybody involved in the federal case except the courtroom sketch artists. Moreover, Judge Mershon asked Trump, to, quote, refrain from making comments or engaging in conduct that has the potential to incite violence, create civil unrest, or jeopardize the safety or well-being of any individuals, and to not engage in words or conduct which jeopardizes the rule of law. Judge Marchand was adamant that this was a request and not an order, and just as adamant that if Trump ignored the request, he, the judge, would take a closer look at making it an order. Exactly how is, if you go after me, I'm coming after you, not words or conduct, which jeopardizes the rule of law. As such, it is incumbent on Judge Mershon to at least do what he warned Trump he would do and go for a move to order Trump's silence. And so Judge Apadia needs to go further even than Jack Smith's office has requested. If she will not detain Trump, and regrettably, I can't imagine she actually would, nobody seems to be willing to draw the line in the sand anywhere here. Everybody, even Smith, seems to believe Trump is capable of processing a warning, which he is not. If the judge will not put him away for observing the pretrial release for exactly 24 hours and then devising as many ways humanly possible to violate it, 
At minimum, she must set stringent restrictions on Trump in person, a gag order, a no social media order, some extraordinary measure against Trump that carries with it that explicit warning. The one loophole in Trump's release on recognizance last Thursday was that it did not carry an advisory that even a five-year-old child or a Donald Trump could understand. Ideally, whatever the judge does now, she should demand Trump's personal appearance at any hearing. In whatever way she chooses to warn him, it should be something conveying that this is his final warning. If you do it again, you will be going to jail. Do you understand me? I'll ask it again. Do you understand you will go to jail? You need something like a big sign to hang around his lawyer's neck, reading, this is your final warning. If you do it again, you will be going to jail. Make the sign that cheap gold spray paint color he loves. He seems to recognize that. He covers his buildings with it. And his hair. Note about Trump's lawyers. Bill Barr said yesterday that, of course, he'd testify against Trump. And it would seem inescapable if your defense for insurrection and an extra constitutional assault on democracy is John Eastman did it. I'm guilty of nothing. I was acting on the advice of counsel. I had the worst counsel in the world. I am an idiot. If that's your defense, then the next time you hire a lawyer, if you are planning ahead, you are going to hire the next worst counsel in the world, and I'd like to sincerely congratulate Trump on finding him. Last Thursday night, this John Loro went on Newsmax and not only confessed on his client's behalf, confessed Trump did ask Mike Pence to cause the electoral vote count to be paused for 10 days, which is one of the charges against Trump under 18 U.S. Code 1512, obstructing an official proceeding. But yesterday, John Laura went on NBC and said the only thing Trump did before January 6th was, quote, a technical violation of the Constitution. And that a technical violation of the Constitution, quote, is not a violation of criminal law. The joke occurred to a lot of us simultaneously. My friend Jeffrey Tambor saying in Arrested Development, there's a good chance I may have committed some light treason. And Trump's light treason was all fine, according to John Loro, even though at the time he committed these acts that his attorney confessed to on national television, Trump was the government official most responsible to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. This was all fine because, as Mr. Loro added, what he didn't do is, you know, send in the tanks. Wow. Thanks, mean Donald. John Loro is already a legal legend. It requires a kind of robotic mindlessness, the likes of which we may never have seen before, to do what he did on Saturday and Sunday. By 6 p.m. Friday, less than two hours after the If You Go After Me, I'm Coming After You post, Jack Smith's office had alerted Judge Opa D.I., and requested that evidentiary protection order. The judge notified Trump's attorneys they had till 5 p.m. Monday to respond, and Loro actually had the nerve to ask that the deadline be pushed to Thursday, and then he did the proverbial Ginsburg yesterday. So he claimed he did not have the time to reply to the government's motion, but he did have the time to go on five different Sunday morning chat shows. This is a Trump lawyer, all right. And for some much-needed comic relief. Besides Mr. Loro, I bring you Ron DeSantis and the rather startling realization that he's not quite dead yet. All the anti-Trump movement within the GOP actually needs to get going, to have a chance, is for Trump to be upset or just to squeak by in one of the early Republican primaries. And the New York Times Siena poll of the earliest primary came out on Friday, just uh, about the same time the If You Go After Me, I'm Coming After You post came out. 
Iowa, January 15th, and it's Trump 43, DeSantis 20, and that's neither an upset nor a squeaker. But it does reflect an amazing reality. Trump's lead in the first primary is about half what it is nationwide over DeSantis. Moreover, while Trump is seen as more electable than DeSantis, it's by only 9%. And all the favorability rankings in Iowa favored DeSantis. DeSantis is considered more likable and more moral. And yes, we are asking people with a death wish if they would prefer hemlock or cyanide. It's a different world out there among Iowa Republicans. But there it is. In Iowa, anyway, Ron DeSantis ain't quite dead. I have no idea why. I mean, just listen to this. Uh, this, um, this, well, the only word is crap. I mean, I had a guy tell me, like, you know, in San Francisco, um, you know, they'll just defecate on the sidewalk. They use drugs out in public, no problem. And I'm like, really? Well, I happened to be in San Francisco a month or two ago, and within 10 minutes of me being in the city, I see some guy relieving himself on the sidewalk with number two. And like, I mean, it's just, I've never seen things like this before. That's called cause and effect, Ron, because you do scare the number two out of people. Imagine a grown man, even in high-heeled boots, saying, number two. Also of interest here, what if they gave a Devin Archer transcribed interview and nobody showed up? The latest whistleblowing event in the endless, useless resultless Republican pursuit of Hunter and thus Joe Biden turns out, like all the others, to be all blow and no whistle. But this one has a truly unforeseen twist. Guess who didn't bother to even attend the Devin Archer transcribed interview with the House Oversight Committee? I mean, I had to read this three times before I believed it. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. This is Sports Center. Wait, check that. Not anymore. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. In sports, nowhere is the difference between real patriotism and the conditional kind more easily seen than when an American player or team contends for an international championship. Do you remember anybody rooting against the conservative Bruce Jenner, now Trumpist bigot Caitlyn Jenner, during the decathlon at the 1976 Olympics? Or if you're too young, you ever heard of anybody having done that? or against the USA team in the 2013 World Baseball Classic because conservative Joe Torre was the manager? Hell, Joe Torre has been one of my best friends in sports since literally the day I started in television, and yeah, we've talked politics. Liberals, in fact, most sports fans, couldn't give a rat's backside about the political leanings of athletes. Nearly all of us would root for an American team in the lawn mowing Olympics. But when the American team was eliminated by Sweden early Sunday morning in the round of 16 at the Women's World Cup of Soccer in Australia, it was a 0-0 tie followed by seven excruciating rounds of penalty kicks, which the U.S. lost 5-4, to four, sealed when a Swedish shot literally crossed the goal line by the absolute minimum amount required for it to count as a score, Republicans, conservatives, and other bigots immediately christened it the woke choke. They blamed Megan Rapino because American players, per international custom, had the choice of singing the anthem at the games of the cup or standing there respectfully. And Rapino stood there respectfully because, well, no, really because she's gay and has purple hair. And she missed a penalty kick, as did two other American players. Therefore, this is all Megan Rapino's fault. And the conservatives are gleeful, wrapping themselves in the American flag, except here when they exulted in an American sports defeat. USA loses, they cheer. 
And of course, if Americans had won, the conservatives would have somehow claimed credit for the victory because they are not patriots. They are lost. Happiest person in sports after this past weekend, Robin Ventura, the former star third baseman, later manager of the Chicago White Sox, who only Friday had had to suffer through the 30th anniversary celebrations of the worst decision he ever made in his life, when on August 4th, 1993, the then 46-year-old future Hall of Famer Nolan Ryan knocked Ventura down with a pitch, Robin charged the mound, and Nolan Ryan did what pitchers never, ever think to do, which is to stay on the mound and take advantage of the extra 10 inches of height the mound gives you. Nolan Ryan just stood there, waited for Ventura to climb the hill. He put Ventura in a headlock and hit him with a couple of light punches and then let him go. That video has been shown more than anything else Robin Ventura ever did, and it's been shown as much as anything else Nolan Ryan ever did. Nolan Ryan threw seven no-hitters. So why is Robin Ventura happy today? Because a day after the 30th celebration of that damn thing, Saturday, Robin Ventura was replaced on the list of the dumbest fight decisions in baseball history and by another member of the Chicago White Sox, no less. As I record this, we are still waiting for the discipline on this one from Major League Baseball. But on Saturday night, Jose Ramirez of the Cleveland Guardians slid into second base and into Tim Anderson of the White Sox. No real collision, no injury, no blood. But when all the Guardians had been mad at Anderson for rough play around the bag over two games and Ramirez reached up his hand expecting Anderson to maybe help him to his feet, Tim Anderson refused. Ramirez then stood up, and Anderson promptly dropped his fielder's glove and squared off in a boxing stance, an actual two fists up by your chin boxing stance. Anderson threw two punches at Ramirez. They both missed. Ramirez took one swing at Anderson and seemed to hit him kind of mildly on the cheek, and Anderson dropped like a stone, like Sonny Liston in his one-punch loss to Muhammad Ali in Lewiston, Maine in 1965, and no one was certain what would happen next. A punch that was seemingly so light that ever since, many have argued Muhammad Ali never hit Sonny Liston, and Liston had thrown the fight at the earliest possible opportunity. That's how bad it looked. Or, as Tom Hamilton, the play-by-play -play man of the Cleveland Clinic Guardians Radio Network put it, in an instant classic of a radio call. And another hustle double. Right over the bag at first. Now Hosey and... Tom Hamilton on the Cleveland Clinic Guardians Radio Network, and that clip is going to be installed at the Hall of Fame at Cooperstown, too, on a loop. Four years ago, Tim Anderson, who we think is conscious by now, was the American League batting champion, and to this day, he is considered one of the faces of the game. He appears in baseball promos trying to sell baseball to kids. Even though he has so vanished, he's hitting 244 that the punch he took from Ramirez seemed like the first time this year that the name Tim Anderson had been mentioned in the same sentence as the word hit. Plus all the no-hitter jokes that followed on Sunday and early today. To make it worse, Tim Anderson did not play in Sunday's game and was not seen by the media and did not talk to the media, which might have been for the better. Because if somebody asked him a tough question about that fight, he would probably have collapsed to the ground again. Thank you, Nancy Faust. One more note. Can a team lose 57 games in a row? Baltimore Orioles 7, New York Mets 3. Since the trade deadline, when the team with the $365 million payroll offloaded six of its veteran players, including future Hall of Famers Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander, the New York Mets have lost all six games they have played, twice by shutout. They have scored only 14 runs, they have given up 39, and frankly, they have not looked as good as those numbers would suggest and they have 51 more games to play this year, and there is no hope whatsoever.
Still ahead on Countdown, turns out ESPN has turned over operations of the ESPN radio network and all its affiliated organizations to an outside company. Sales, I guess editorial control. This has made me sad because I was one of the guys who put ESPN radio on the air in 1992. But remembering that made me happy because it reminded me unexpectedly of Elizabeth Montgomery and her role in that memorable launch. So I want to explain to you what that has to do with the other thing and tell you about my sudden and eternal friend Lizzie coming up in things I promise not to tell. First, time for the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze, the New York Times. This is the Fox News effect. It's upper right corner banner headline about Trump's indictment. Allies prepare for fight over free speech after indictment calls out lies. Now, the Times put single quotation marks, which is how in print you show you're not really convinced the word works or is true. That's just what somebody else is calling it. The Times wanted to qualify one word in that headline. Allies prepare for fight over free speech after indictment calls out lies. Now, you and I would put the quotes around free speech because Trump's crimes have got nothing to do with free speech and his apologist's claim is nonsensical in both constitutional and legal ways. It's got nothing to do with free speech. You put free speech in quotes. But no, the Times put the dubious quotes around the word lies. As if Trump's lies, you know, weren't lies. As if the Times doesn't want to commit to that much shameful, both sides is garbage, and par for the course for the Times lately, convinced somehow they are going to sell more copies of the newspaper to right-wingers who want to burn their building down. The Times needs to fire its decision makers and pronto. Speaking of which, the runner-up, Vivek Ramaswamy, what the hell is wrong with this guy? If you want to tell the crowd at Vail, Iowa over the weekend that we should, quote, cancel Juneteenth or one of the other useless ones we made up about holidays, and then when NBC asks you if you think it is a useless holiday, go ahead, I guess, say, uh-huh, which is what he did. I mean, if this guy doesn't understand he's trying to run for the nomination of a party, at least half of whose members would identify him as having the kind of ethnic origin their party is against. It's his money he's wasting. But on Juneteenth, which is only like six, seven weeks ago, this moron Ramaswamy put out a fake, sincere video extolling the holiday, praising Juneteenth. Juneteenth is a new holiday, he said. It needn't be about grievance and self-flogging. Let it be a celebration of the American dream itself, which I guess he thinks is also useless. He was for Juneteenth before he was against it? Ramaswamy can't keep his policy decisions straight about holidays? A master strategist this is not. But our winner, again speaking of that, James Comer. Jamie, chairman of the House Subcommittee on Making Up Headlines for Conservative Media. When his low-rent version of the House Un-American Activities Committee finally got its transcribed interview with Hunter Biden's old business associate Devin Archer, the interview so lackluster and so exonerating of the president that even the Wall Street Journal editorial board admitted Joe Biden had nothing to do with any of this, Comer still called the Archer interview a, quote, bombshell. In fact, Greg Kelly, who, if you're not familiar with his work, is the animal mascot of Newsmax television, Greg Kelly interviewed Comer and said, quote, you were in the room. Are these guys recognizing that this is beyond their control now? And Comer answered, the walls are closing in. Unfortunately, Comer wouldn't have known anything about the walls or the walls in the room or anything about the interview or the interview in the room because it turned out he didn't go to it. He skipped the Archer interview. He didn't attend. He blew it off. He didn't even zoom in. He didn't even literally phone it in. In fact, it appears all but two Republican members of the committee didn't bother to show up even remotely. So... If you see the whole Devin Archer, Burisma, Ukraine, Hunter Biden, influence peddling thing disappear from the GOP playbook in the days and weeks to come, remember, this was the first sign. They have punted because there is no there there. Chairman James 
Maybe we can connect Jill Biden calling herself doctor to Ukraine or something. Comer, today's worst person in the world. Number one story on the countdown and my favorite subject, me and things I promised not to tell. I have found myself telling her story three times in the last 10 days. I just bought a new copy of the movie in question. And so I thought I would tell you the story now. Plus, I find she made her Broadway debut 69 years ago this Thursday. Do you know her name? Elizabeth Montgomery. One of the most famous actresses of the 1960s and 1970s, star of the TV series Bewitched, daughter of a famous actor Robert Montgomery, and my friend from early on the morning of January 14th, 1992, until she died in the spring of 1995. Our friendship happened only because of one thing. My sister had given me a book about one of our favorite topics. The never-to-be-solved mystery of Lizzie Borden and the Borden family axe murders of 1892 in Fall River, Massachusetts. Yes, we're weird. And also the fact that Elizabeth Montgomery had played Lizzie Borden in a TV movie. So on January 14th, 1992, as I sat waiting for our flight to leave ICJFK Airport in New York for my then home in Los Angeles, then I began to read from my airplane seat my sister's gift from the aisle... From the last one to board, I hear the voice of Elizabeth Montgomery saying to me, Ooh, Keith, you're reading about me. She was a gas. My brief but eternal friendship with Lizzie Montgomery and the eternal lesson she taught me. In one moment, please, while I first explain what I was doing on that flight. A month or two earlier, I had agreed to join ESPN to co-host SportsCenter with Dan Patrick starting in late March 1992. I had just finished up three financially rewarding but soul-sucking years at Channel 2 in Los Angeles, and I was going to go to Hawaii for three months and just lie there until I felt better. On Monday, December 30th, 1991, I had literally just opened my address book to find the number of a travel agent I knew to make the Hawaii arrangements. I was reaching for the phone when the phone rang. It was my business agent who had just gotten off the phone with my new ESPN boss, John Walsh. He and they were launching a new radio network in five days. I found this interesting, but not particularly relevant. ESPN was one thing then. It was one TV network. No magazine, no radio, no ESPN, the Ocho. So this was their first big move outwards. The radio network would start with only two seven-hour shows on Saturday and Sunday nights. And Walsh explained to my agent that everything was going great, and they were right on target, and they had great guests lined up for the first weekend, like Ronald Reagan, and they only had one tiny problem. They needed three hosts, and they had two terrific hosts, just terrific hosts, one Keith worked with named Tony Bruno, and another terrific, just terrific host from Providence named Chuck Wilson, and they tried this guy as the third host, and that guy, and this guy, and that guy, and all told, 40 different people had tried out to be hosts. They had nobody, nobody to be the third host who was any good. Could Keith just come here just for the first weekend just to get it off the ground? Then he can go back to L.A. and come back here in March, take over Sports Center. Please, 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 can Keith help us? Please, because if he can, I don't know what on earth we're going to do. Oh, please, please, please. As I said to my agent, well, all right, I suppose. At least, way at least, ESPN will always think of me as a team player. <laughs> so instead of going to Hawaii... In January, I go to Bristol, Connecticut in January, and I go stay at my folks' house outside New York City, and a friend I had recommended to help ESPN launch their radio network offers me a ride up to ESPN for the weekend, and it's like 20 degrees, and we get out of his car in his parking lot, and three spots over getting out of his car in the parking lot is Chris Berman, who I went to high school with, and already in January 1992, when I'm not quite 33 years old, I already know Chris for 20 years, and before I can say, hey, he screams, listen, we have a good thing going here. Don't F it up. And I say, good to see you too, Chris. And I remind myself it's only till Monday. And I meet the gang, and then I go to the hotel, and the hotel is beige, the walls are beige, the carpets are beige, the guests are beige, the food is beige. The only thing that isn't beige is the six inches of snow that falls overnight. And I remind myself, it's only till Monday. 
The launch of the network on Saturday goes well. They have me interview Ronald Reagan about something in football. The Sunday night show is going well, too, and we're trying to figure out where the big baseball free agent of that winner, Danny Tartable, is going to sign. And we're interviewing Bobby Valentine, who was the manager of the Texas Rangers. And they were one of the teams rumored to be a likely landing for Tartable. And I asked Valentine, he says, no, not anymore. They just canceled their trip. I was supposed to go meet them at the airport tonight. I think he signed with somebody else. And the alarm bells go off in my head. And I tell the producer, let's call everybody we know in baseball and put them on and figure out where Danny Tartable is going. I have a source who knows his agent. Let me call him. We'll go story chasing. So we spend four hours following a story in real time, and it's great radio. And we're coming up on the last hour, and our guests have helped us eliminate like 30 teams out of 28. But we're not sure where Tartable is going still. And the producer says, if only we had his home phone number. And I look at the producer and go, oh, crap. Sorry. And I grab my address book and I explain, yeah, he was my co-host, Tartable was, on, on some of our baseball post-game shows in L.A. last year. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot I, I had his number all this time. Hang on. So I call Danny Tartable, and just as our last hour on Sunday night is starting, he calls me back and I say to him, look, we know you've decided it's all over baseball. It's got to be the Phillies, the Mets, or the Yankees. And he's saying correctly, I can't tell you. And I said, give me one guess. And just tell me if I'm wrong, and I will call you a source close to the negotiations. That's all. And he says, okay. And I say, is it a team that wears pinstripes? And, of course, the Phillies, the Mets, and the Yankees all wear pinstripes. So he laughs, and he says, yes. And I say, is it the team I grew up a fan of? And he says, what team did you grow up a fan of? And, by the way, this phone call is taking place with me on the floor of the studio in which the other two hosts are live on the new radio network. So I whisper to Tartable, if I say it's the Yankees, am I wrong? And he says, I can't tell you, and starts whispering. But off the record, the press conference is Wednesday at Yankee Stadium. Is that enough for you, you bastard? And, of course, I said, no, come on the show and tell us. Come on. And he laughs and says, I'll see you Wednesday, and hangs up. And I get up, and I sit in the vacant chair, and I can say, breaking news, ESPN report uh, now that the free agent outfielder Danny Tartable has agreed to a multi-year deal with the New York Yankees. Sources close to the negotiations say there will be a press conference Wednesday at Yankee Stadium. And the other hosts are trying not to crack up because they know I've just been talking to Tartable from the phone in the same room with them. Well, this story explodes way more than it deserved. It's a dull Sunday night. It's still early enough in the evening that the story makes all the Monday newspapers, and it's attributed not to ESPN or to SportsCenter, but to the brand new ESPN radio network on its second day in business, and it's on the front page of USA Today and the New York Times. New ESPN radio network makes splash with Tartable Scoop the next morning, and I can't tell you how big a deal that was back then in 1992. So now, instead of going back to L.A. on Monday and maybe to Hawaii on Tuesday, as I had planned, I have to go to the press conference at Yankee Stadium to say hi to Tartable on Wednesday and sort of thank him for the scoop. And on Tuesday... This guy, John Walsh from ESPN, calls me and my agent and says, look, we have to take advantage of this. It's the best possible start we could have hoped for for the radio network. Keith has to stay with us for the next three months. Why doesn't he stay and, and do this weekend and then go back to L.A. and pack up his apartment and then come back here the weekend after that? And, and, and. And I say again to my agent, well, at least ESPN will always think of me as a team player if I do this. <laughs> So I am not in Hawaii, and instead I am on board this flight when Elizabeth Montgomery walks down the aisle and sees my Lizzie Borden book given to me by my sister and says, Ooh, Keith, you're reading about me. Hi, I'm Lizzie Montgomery. I'm a big fan of yours. Is that seat taken? And I say, The hell if I care. Sit down. And the only time we're not talking for the next six hours is when we are drinking. I believe, if I remember this correctly, they had to send up a champagne refueling flight halfway to L.A., and she's a huge sports fan. Her father was a founder of one of the Southern California horse racing tracks. And she loves the Lakers. And she thinks she was related to Lizzie Borden. Did I ever see the European version of her Lizzie Borden film where they show the wide shots where they make it look like she's nude? And I say, I'm absolutely certain I have not. And her son and her driver and her Rolls Royce meet us at LAX. And she wants me to see her house. And then her driver and her Rolls Royce will give me a lift home. And oh, by the way, she's flying back to New York in a week. Should we become flying buddies? On that trip, our flight gets canceled, 
and we have to find a new one. I'm hand carrying a lot of my more valuable baseball cards, including like 500 different from the year 1909. And she wants to see them. And she wants me to tell her something about each player while we drink again. And we land and she says, how are you getting to your folks house? And I say, well, I'm going to get a, a car here or something. And she says, no, you're not. I'll give you a lift in my limo. I'm going right past your house. And sure enough, we get there. And as Lizzie Montgomery's limo is taking me to my folks house at 10 o'clock at night, she says, will they still be up your folks? You want to play a practical joke on them? So two minutes later, I knock on the door of my childhood home and my father opens it. Instead of seeing me, it's her in the doorway. And she says, hi, Mr. Olderman. I'm Lizzie. I'm a friend of Keith's. Can he come out and play? And my dad goes silent for the only time I, in my life. And now my mother appears so Lizzie can pull the same routine on her. Hi, Mrs. Olderman. I'm Lizzie. I'm a friend of Keith's. Can he come out and play? And now my mother is silent for the only time in my life. I might add, I thought Lizzie looked fabulous, and I looked her up in Hallowell's film, film Guide, and I saw she was 48, and I thought, boy, she looks fabulous for 48, and then I realized my math is wrong. She was 58, and she was a joy. We talked by phone every couple of weeks after that, and she died three years later of colon cancer. But she is with me always, and not just as the proverbial force of nature. Within minutes of that day we met, January 14th, 1992, she bestowed upon me a lesson, an eternal lesson. We were a little late taking off, and since she had just loudly introduced herself to me like I didn't know who she was, anybody on the plane who wasn't sure it was her was now sure. As we waited a taxi, every man on that plane came over and did the same thing. Oh, hi, Miss Montgomery, excuse me and they give me some sort of nodding acknowledgement, like, hey, how you doing, as they lean in past me. I was a big fan of Bewitched. I know you must get asked this a million times a day, but is there any chance? I'm so sorry to ask. Could you do that little nose twitch you used to do in the show? And she would say, of course, and then she'd do it, and these men aged 20 to 100 all then giggle like schoolboys. <laughs> After the 30th or 31st time this happened, I say to her, Lizzie, I don't know you, but I like you a lot already. And your attitude towards your fans and the nose twitch is wonderful. But I have to tell you, I certainly hope that was the last of them because the next one who comes over, I'm going to have to strangle him with my bare hands because I can't take it anymore. And for the only minutes of all the time I knew her, Elizabeth Montgomery got very serious and said, oh, no, Keith. That is not the attitude you must have about this. Remind me, what year did Bewitched go off the air? I had to guess. 1972? And she said, exactly. Good. Correct. 20 years ago. And these people have remembered that nose twitch for 20 years, at least. Bewitched, Keith, is not Hamlet. It is not Arthur Miller. It is not The Godfather, but they remembered it. This is why you and I both do what we do for a living. We have transcended time with what we do for a living. Something artistic, something creative, no matter how small, that we have done, they have remembered it. People do it with you, I'm sure, and I'm sure they'll continue to. And what you do then is you say, thank you for remembering, as if they were the only one who ever remembered, because that's why we do this because they remembered me from 20 years ago for a stupid little nose twitch. Duly chastised, I apologized, and the huge, welcoming, conspiratorial, permanent friendship, sexy smile of Elizabeth Montgomery broke across her face like the sunrise, and she whispered, Either that, Keith... Or they saw Bewitched on cable last week, which means Lizzie gets another check next week. And she twitched her nose at me. And I will always love her. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Here are the credits. Most of the music arranged, produced, and performed by Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel, who are the Countdown Musical Directors. 
All orchestration and keyboards by John Philip Chanel. Guitars, bass, and drums by Brian Ray. Produced by TKO Brothers. Other Beethoven selections have been arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2. It was written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Musical comments by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Kenny Main. Everything else was pretty much my fault. Special thank you to you for last week with the addition of the YouTube option for listening to and or watching this podcast, our audience total was, last week, more than 800,000, which used to be a pretty good month. Thanks. Tell the others. That's countdown for this, the 943rd day since Donald Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Arrest him again while we still can. Lord knows there is more there where that came from. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow, bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.